Welcome to episode 356 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and joining me all the way from Los Angeles is my friend Eric Vidal. How's it going today, Eric? Pretty good. How you doing, Dan? Well, you know, clearly we're pretty good. I usually say brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and that has never been more true on a day like today, because for the, just the audio listeners, it's I just sound a little bit better, right? I sound a little bit better, and for those watching... That is because we are in the Blue Wire studio in the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. And while I didn't come all the way to Las Vegas for the show to hear, to be here at the studio, Blue Wire was kind enough to let me uh, bring you our first end of the season show from their fancy studio where people much, much, much more important than me get to say the words. But Eric, today you and I are going to be saying the words, almost a eulogy to the FC Barcelona season. <laughs> you ready to go? Ready when you are. All right. Well, while the club was busy celebrating the 30th anniversary of Wembley and the Dream Team and all the good moments, Barca did manage a 2-0 loss to Villarreal at home at the Camp Nou, a place that they have struggled over the last few weeks. And just breaking down those goals very quickly, the first goal, Busquets and De Jong were split after De Jong played a pass behind Adama Traore, and none of the three got back in time as Danny Alves stayed central to cover for Busquets. Araujo stepped with the man in the middle, and the space in behind was then filled by Villarreal. A counterattack after controlling so much of the positive play, that was a negative there. Second goal, Adama Traore mistake. I'm not sure, Eric, if we really truly even to say much more than Adama Traore winds up it was unfortunate because it started well. He didn't play in the middle because Uzmai Dembele was one of the best wingers in the world for about two and a half months there and then winds up capping off his first team career with a, a pretty rough assist to the opponent. Yeah, that's the big takeaway from the match, really, is it's it's such a disappointing send-off for Adama Torre. Showed so much promise, could have offered so much to the team, and for this to be the way that we remember him is with, you know, two defensive uh, mistakes that lead to a really disappointing end to the La Liga season. It's just unfortunate. Yeah, and, and when I'm trying to think about what we take from that match, because again, the end of the season, and by my count, almost half the players in that match likely will not be here next summer. So they may be here next season, but by next summer, over half of those players are probably gone. And so the thing I think from that match, you know, putting the positive spin on it, uh, as I did not do a match review, uh, match review for YouTube, I decided not to be too negative with those. My one positive was Busquets and Araujo, because those two, of course, will be around next season, as well as I, I had my count of being six from the starting lineup, being Busi, Araujo, Gabi, Ter Stegen, Alba, and Ferran Torres, all of those to return. And I thought Busi, yes, he was split with De Jong on that first goal. But other than that, Busquets was probably the best outfield player on the field, along with Araujo, who defensively does what he needs to do. And I thought with the ball yesterday, he was pretty good as well. Um, but other than that, not too many bright spots. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. Uh, not not a lot to take away from there uh, other than disappointing into the to the season and really kind of highlights how much work there is left to, get, to go. So if anything, it sets a good tone for the off season to make sure that all the coolies know that we've got a lot of work to do. And, you know, there are moments in the season that have felt great, but this is the reality of our club right now. We've got some work to do this offseason. Yeah, then just running down through the rest of the, say, starting lineup and into the bench there. Danny Alves, he's back probably until December. We'll get to that in a second with the World Cup in Qatar when he wants to have his farewell, his swan song. And then Obama Yang will be in year two of a two-year deal. So expect him to be around for that reason. And then Frankie de Young is in that category of who knows. Ling Lei and Adama both gone by different means in different ways. And then... Coming off the bench, a last goodbye to Ismane Dembele is certainly what it felt like. I don't know if the Camp Nou crowd was totally attuned necessarily. I mean, they know, but I don't necessarily know if their reactions to Dembele were based on either we would love if you stayed or, you know, goodbye, thanks for your five years. It, it, there didn't seem to be an exact moment at the Camp Nou when, when that occurred. You know, I would, like we'll get to in a second, I would love if he stuck around, as so many would, but more likely he is gone. And then Memphis... Just like Frankie de Young, who knows there? And then Ricky Pooj and Oscar Mingetha, both they, I mean, people were asking, why didn't Luke de Young get a shout? Well, that's because Ricky Pooj and Oscar Mingetha have both been around the club for a decade plus. Remember that Oscar Mingetha showed up as, I believe, an eight-year-old, and Ricky was, I think, around 12, 13 years old, having come over from his local side, uh, Teresa, that was Xavi's old side. So those two, it was a final goodbye for them at the club, and everybody kind of understood that. And then Ansu Fati, the final sub there, just stay healthy. That was just <laughs> another one of those, like, hey, things aren't going our way. way. It's 2 nothing. Here's that shiny Ansu Fati to distract everybody for a little bit. Yeah, Ansu was the feel-good moment, right? It was yeah. 
something that we've wanted to see for months, getting him extra play time on a day that was already, I think the game had already been lost basically by the time he came on, right? So for sure. it was just for show, just to make us feel good. Yeah. Yeah, and again, for Ricky Puj and Oscar Mangetha, uh, I feel like with them actually going off to the Catalan national team as well, that they don't get a proper send-off, they don't get a proper goodbye, if you will, with the end of the season. And in any way, going and facing the A-League All-Stars in Australia then on Wednesday, two days from now, doesn't really feel like the end of a season either. It feels like the season has ended. But yeah, Ricky Puj and Oscar Mangetha, I mean, Eric, you're the one who gets the fortunate, uh, I guess, final eulogy for those two players, I mean, Ricky Pooj, especially while Frances was regularly hosting the show with me, was uh, he was not even a polarizing figure. He was a polarizing figure for those who were trying to force him in the squad when the squad desperately needed youth, definitely, def desperately needed somebody. But then once Pedri and Gabi came along, it all made sense where Ricky Pooj belonged in the depth chart. So I feel like this was the year where there was just a lot of quiet. He's 22, moving on 23. It, his, his, the ship has sailed. It's over. And then for Mangetha, did really well for six months under Mano Kuman. And even under Kuman this year, you could tell that even with Danny Alves returning, Oscar Mangetha's time was also going to be limited. And really, the only purpose those two did uh, wound up serving for the club were 23, 24, 25 on the first team squad list. Yeah, I think the farewell for those two players is hopefully a see you later more than a thank you for your service, you know, never, never see you again. Um, they're still young, you know, whether we, we loan them or sell them, I hope this is a, a come back and talk to us in a couple of years. You know, now is not their moment. And I think that's, you know, evident across all the fans that composition of the team is not in their favor right now. But there's no reason that their future with the club can't, you know, circle back around and that they can finish out strong or you know, really have an opportunity to become a Barcelona legend like the two of them have wanted their whole lives. So, you know, I, I I walk away from the two of them thinking it was a missed opportunity this season, something that I really personally would have liked to have seen the two of them develop more and get more playing time. But, you know, it was evident why that didn't happen. And so I just hope that they get uh, another shot in a couple of years. And I do wonder what their levels are as well. With Ricky Puj, I keep seeing Celta de Vigo, and as I've said many times, there are certain teams in the Liga where you can see that Ricky Puj and his ability to move the ball horizontally, side to side, quickly. He doesn't really control the pace of a game in the way that clearly Pedri does, taking after the, again, when Iniesta and Xavi, you say those names. And early on, that's what Ricky Puj was getting compared to. Of course, any midfielder is going to break through is going to be compared to who's just come before and the way that they dictate a game. And I think Pooch has the ability to do that, but again, not for an FC Barcelona, not for every other team's best shot, but for a Celta de Vigo, being a third or fourth midfielder, I mean, Eric, I'll ask you this, right? Like what their level is. And I say Celta de Vigo just because I keep thinking of Denis Suarez as well. You know, Ricky Pooch's career at, at Barcelona is not too different from Denis Suarez, even though Suarez is a bit farther forward on the field. And Magetha, I think, is kind of almost in the same boat. And even to the point, maybe like a Sergi Gomez at Sevilla, that that might be as high as Mingetha can go. And listen, if you wind up being the fourth or fifth midfielder or third midfielder for a long time at a club, Sevilla might even be a big, big for Oscar Mingetha, but who knows? You know, he's still just 22 years old. So for both Puj and Mingetha, Eric, you know, what do you think their level is? Where is that ceiling? I mean, I don't think it's a see you later at Barcelona, but they could be at a Champions League squad somewhere down the road. I think they're definitely starters at a club that competes in the Europa League every year. Um, whether or not they're Champions League caliber, I think is probably up to their development because they're so young. But I think the two of them could slot into being a first or second choice starter for um, somebody who's going deep into the Europa League. You know, uh, Ricky needs time. He needs confidence and he needs to grow quite physically. He gets bullied by defenders and other players on the pitch. He's, you know, tricky and small and nimble and he can do a lot with his feet but man he's his size is going to be a problem for his career and so that's that's going to put a ceiling on unless he addresses that and really kind of can compete with the big boys literally um and if he does that then you know sure there's a case to be made that he could then be a champions league caliber player and maybe getting in with a lower seed champions league team and getting some experience leads him back to a first team like like a Barcelona, but it's a it's going to be a journey for him. And I think for Mingueza too. Mingueza probably has a much lower ceiling than Ricky, but he's, you know, he did well for us in, in center back. He did well for us at right back. He he plugged holes all along that back line. And and Ricky, or sorry, Mingueza is a, a very talented player. He's very capable, but 
he's maybe one of those more defensive utility players than he is somebody with a lot of upside that can go and make a huge impact on a team. He's a great reserve player. He'll do well at teams that compete in the uh, Europa League, but you know, Champions League Plus, I think, is a stretch for him. Yeah, here's the good news for Mangetha. Last season, when he was getting, we'll say, regular minutes under Kuman, as far as passing center backs under the age of 22, he had very high metrics in progressive passing. Again, he's it's nowhere near where Eric Garcia is. It's nowhere near where Juan Araujo needs to be to develop, right? It's nowhere near where Eric, I mean, uh, where Gerard Piquet and some of the better passing center backs, even Matthias Delict, where those center backs lie. But as far as being an under 22 passing center back, one who understands positional play, can play multiple roles. He has played, I wouldn't put him at left back anywhere, right? I think that's where he's bottom of the table, La Liga team. <laughs> yeah. But as far as center back and right back, you're right. He can be not only a utility piece, but where is his ceiling? When he, as a center back, hits 25, as long as he's getting cur- as long as he's getting regular game time and his passing continues to just be what it is and he has a system that supports him, you know, as, as I said, I think he could wind up having a very long, fruitful career because of what he intrinsically has learned at the academy and Pooja the same way. So I think we know where we're both on for those two. So for Eric, I, I want to do, and I've been doing this all the recent guests, by the way, I want to play a quick game of keep, sell, or leave. And because this is the first show, we'll say in the off season, if you will, again, not counting the mm-hmm. <laughs> trip to Australia, we're going to go through every member of the squad. And real quick, we're going to do maybe a line or two about each of them. It's keep, sell, and it's and by loan, I also mean leave because again, there's some that it doesn't matter what you and I say with Luke De Young unless we're insane, we're not going <laughs> to renew Luke De Young. That's not going to happen, uh, even if Barcelona right. had the ability. So let's start with goalkeeper uh, Mark Andre Ter Stegen. Ooh, that's tough. I'm going to say keep for now, but he certainly has had you know a very human season. If there's a season that I could see him leaving at, it would be this off season. Well, I'm going to add the immediate caveat here that the number that we've seen, I mean, I've seen those Catalan journalists, they've gone crazy with the numbers, the double digits of Exodus. And, you know, I think the number here is about seven sales. Seven sales is about what the club would like to do to wound to wind up being able to fit everybody they're trying to bring in free transfers and bargain bin. Un, in within that wage structure. When it comes to financial fair play, of course, transfer fees are going to be important. But as we've talked many, many times, the CVC deal and Barca Studios selling a portion of that and any other income that's made through sponsorships and even the naming rights of the stadium, all of that stuff is what's going to make sure that Barcelona stay within financial fair play, even more so than whatever they're going to recoup on on Samuel Umtiti. Like, don't don't worry about that. Whether it's $2 million or $6 million, I might even be uh, a bit too... They're trying to be advantageous with that. And so why I say... I, I'm not going to push back on Ter Stegen too much. The reason why, for me, it's an unassailable keep is because if that number is seven, just looking at the rest of the squad list, I think Barcelona are going to have way too much to do if they wind up selling Ter Stegen to find a first-team or first-choice goalkeeper on the market. I just think it's going to be too difficult with if they really, truly want to bring in eight or eight other players or six to eight other players, it's going to be too difficult and you're going to have to fulfill your squad somehow. So, because that's why the next one is Neto. And for me, it's an immediate sell. You have to sell Neto for something in the Liga. It's got to be 10. It's got to be five or 10, somewhere in that range. And then Inaki Pena with Galatasaray has been good enough. And Arnaud Tanas is the other guy underneath him. I'm also keeping Arnaud Tanas, who's shown a lot of promise as a young goalkeeper. One of those two is the backup next year. You just have to do that. Yeah, and that would be a totally acceptable situation at goalkeeper, right? Um, Ter Stegen, you know, if you're looking for someone to offload, he's not the guy. But if there's an opportunity on the market, I could see this being a season that that he's interesting. But but you're right. Uh, who is it? Inaki Pena coming back from Galatasaray? Yeah, absolutely. Put put him in. Sell sell Inaki Pena or not Inaki Pena? What's his other name? Oh, no, Tenas. So, no. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, so, yeah. but for as far as Ter Stegen goes, well, I, I'll, I'll say this: it's we're going to get to Busquets in a second. But there are guys that in this off season you say we got to do one more year with him. And for Ter Stegen, you know, he's going to have the opportunity to we'll say make up for this season. And you look ahead to next year and say that next year is the year where if you need to get something for Ter Stegen, he's still going to be we'll say young enough for a goalkeeper where you can move him on for the right deal, if the right guy's available, and make that move. Again, see how Pena and Tanas uh, do develop as well. Uh, for the, uh, Tanas still a bit young. So next one's really easy for you. Ron Araujo, of course, you got to get him away. You got to sell him, you know, for $200 million. Just get him off the books. Oh, 200 mil? Go for it. <laughs> Go for it. 200 mil? 
Uh, less than 200 mil, keep that guy. That guy's incredible. Well, actually, if PSG's on the phone, and since financial fair play, well, again, we're also going to talk about Mbappe later, since financial fair play doesn't matter, it's 1 billion. Like, that's actually the cost of Araujo. Like, if, if PSG... Great, just, 1 billion, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> fine, I will concede 1 billion. That is Ron Araujo. That's his release clause. So, PSG, if they come calling, then, yeah, sure. Pay the 1 billion release clause, and you're good to go. Eric Garcia, uh, for those who say sell, I go back to my numbers here as far as... If you're going to sell seven, eight players, good luck also getting rid of Garcia and then trying to find two to three center backs. So I'm not trying to take the words out of your mouth here, but for Garcia, I also believe in him a bit as a definitely the third center back and maybe arguably eventually uh, Araujo's partner if a lot goes right for him and he develops properly defensively the way we need him to. Uh, so I'm definitely keeping our Garcia. Yeah, keep for me too. I don't, I don't see any reason to sell him. He's... Uh, had an uneven start for us, for sure, but there's no no urgent need to sell him. Next up is Langley, and he's difficult because, I mean, the answer is going to be sell. I know it's sell for you. The problem with him, unlike uh, and Titi and Langley have two different problems, where Langley's in a position where he can choose to say, and potentially he might even be, even if he's not in Xavi's plans, I mean, he might just be that fourth or fifth center back who's available for three matches next year if he truly wants to continue to fulfill his contract, where I believe... He, if he did take a reduction, it was one of the smaller reductions. And he was also one of the bigger, uh, on the bigger wages. So I think he was one of the ones that kicked the can down the road and said, hey, if we're going to sell me, then maybe we're going to sell me next summer. Let me make what I'm going to make this year in 22-23. And that's the way it's going to go. So for Langley, again, Eric, I mean, the answer is sell. And if you want to add anything to Langley, you can. But the problem is going to be for him, I think even more so than Umtiti with his new contract, how is Barcelona going to sell Langley if he doesn't want to go? Yeah, he's a sell for me as well, and I agree with you on all the other points. So, you know, it's uh, if we have to keep Langley, that's that's fine. And and if the opportunity says that that means that in the winter or the summer he goes, then you know his his future with us is going to be short lived from here on out. But um, you know, we we don't need him right now, so so he could he could go. Well, we got our first sacred cow now. It's Jard PK Eric, and for all those for Jard PK, it's almost. A question for him more than it is for us, right? Is Gerard KPK the person who gets to choose, not about a sale, but uh, whether or not he wants to keep, meaning whether or not he wants to stay, or whether or not he wants to hang up those boots and, uh, you know, go go contend with tennis tournaments and planning and logistics and uh, go wherever he needs to go, Saudi Arabia for deals, whatever it is. So Gerard PK, uh, first of our sacred cows, Eric. Um, I, I will agree with you that the decision is definitely going to be his, but if the decision were mine, he's too old, he needs to go. Interesting. Okay. You know, I actually would keep him because I think as far as his performances, it was better than the last two seasons. If anything, he raised his performances this year. And even if his individual performances have not been all glaring, I mean, all sparkling because of the, the age that he's at, sure, for some reason, Barca's backline has been better with him. And there is a moment when Ron Araujo is going to get the absolutely the keys to the car. It's, it's a sports car. That is Barcelona's back line. It's a high line. You know, you got to know a lot of things and you got to be where you need to be. And even though he's fantastic defensively, of course, 1v1s, just the positional sense of Ronald Araujo in proportion to his other back line mates, right? It's not his individual positioning that ever concerns me at Araujo. It's how that back four works in tandem. And so that's probably why he's worked best with Danny Alves because he also, that being Alves, moves the slowest giving Araujo the most time to react to where Alva's position is. And so when there are those speedier right backs like a Dest, Araujo and Dest do kind of struggle because neither are totally correct positionally, defensively together. And so there is going to come a moment, as I said, when Eric Garcia and Araujo, and it's, it's their time, but I don't know if next year is still really that time. Even if PK is the third center back, that's totally fair. But I mean, whatever you want to say about this season, he was one of the top two. Like he was one of the two starters. Yeah, he definitely was. I mean, it was a good season for PK. Uh, I just think it's a, an inflection. We're at an inflection point with our club, and I think that we need to be looking towards the future. And any more than one season left on PK is probably all he's really got left. And after that, you know, we, we need to be thinking about the future and keeping around some of these older sacred cows. It's just not going to make sense for our future plans for a while. So he he showed it this season that he can definitely play the next season. And And like I said, and agreeing with you that the decision has to be his right now. Uh, he certainly earned that. But would I be heartbroken if he left this season or this offseason? No, not really. Um, but I would definitely say that the, the clock is ticking and, and the time to go before he 
passes his prime and becomes a liability to us is probably this season. This is probably probably it for him. I think you're probably it. That's what I mean. Even if he's around, he shouldn't be a starter. And that is going to continue as we go through this list. It's going to be an issue with those yeah. quote-unquote sacred cows. That if they are around, they are starters. But Barcelona, and this is a good problem to have, I guess, for the last decade, is they are very, very difficult to replace, even at this age, when they're still so, so good. So speaking of replacing, uh, actually, believe it or not, age, Samuel Umtiti, even though his knees are in their late 30s to 40s to 50s, he as a player, as an age, as a person, as a footballer, is still technically in his prime if he, in theory, is in some kind of form to do well for, uh, you said, go back to his former club in Lyon. Uh, with Umtiti, I kind of jumped the ship there where it's definitely a sale and it sounds like Umtiti is finally open to be sold, especially now that he's agreed and again, a credit to Umtiti, where he held out over the summertime, which is frustrating. And one of those reasons why Barcelona really struggled over the summer to have such a high wage structure. But if those numbers are to be believed, it wouldn't have mattered if Umtiti had taken that, that reduction in salary then or when he did in January to allow Ferran Torres to be registered. It didn't really matter and didn't affect. But it did matter in January to get those four guys on the books. And Umtiti did the club a favor in that way. You know, the club didn't really owe him that, and he did it anyway. So good on Samuel Titi for doing that. And that also makes his contract a lot easier to move. That means that that transfer fee, again, it doesn't matter what the transfer fee is. It matters that another club is going to be willing to take on his wages. And for Titi, you know, it's a, not only is it a sell, but it's kind of a sell at, in the right way. Like kind of having him leave in uh, an, unexpected, uh, an unexpected, unceremonious way. And actually kind of the same way that Felipe Coutinho's leaving too, right? Like, uh, and... Umtiti was a better success than, Umtiti, than Coutinho was at his best. But Umtiti, that was a long time ago, right? So he's kind of leaving after we've already been stuck with him, right? And it's kind of, you're almost apoplectic to his exodus from the club. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an unfortunate departure for Samuel Umtiti. If, if he had left a couple of years ago, we would be saying very different things about him on the way out. Um, but because of the way the last couple of years have gone, because of um, his injury history, because of the way that, just the club has managed these last couple of years. Uh, Samuel MTT leaves, like you said, very unceremoniously. And, and it's unfortunate because of how good he was and how good he could have been. But, um, you know, the front office needs to be responsible in how they offload his wages. But he needs to, you know, he definitely needs to go. And it's just, you know, it's a very unfortunate um, story for him to leave behind. I wish I wish it had gone better. He sure, certainly showed the signs that he could have been one of our answers in defense and maybe had... Uh, had he stayed healthy, he could have helped us out a lot in the last couple of seasons in particular where we struggled defensively. But, um, you know, just just sad for Samuel and TT. And, and I really uh, hope that the club takes care of his wages the right way and that we don't get left with any uh, extra wages on the books because, you know, the front office can't close or something. Well, I don't know how many people are listening to this at the end of the season for the very first time. So I I Doubt we have a lot of first-time uh, the Barcelona podcast listeners today, so they know where I stand on Jordi Alba, right? Like it's 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 a keep, and it's not even a keep. It's that look at the rest of the market. There's he's going to be the starter next year. It's there's there is only a backup potentially coming to FC Barcelona. So Jordi Alba unequivocally it's a keep, and what that timeline is for how long he's kept is completely dependent upon the market, upon how much Barcelona has to spend on the left back position. Because I keep reiterating it. To get a left back that is anywhere near Jordi Alba is going to cost a lot. It's going to cost 30 to 45 million to 50 million. Look at what Kyle Walker went to Man City. Look at what fullbacks have gone for over the last few seasons. And then even look at Jao Cancelo, where he was on Valencia for a long time, entered his prime, goes to Man City for, I mean, even that was kind of a bargain. And Barcelona are going to have to find some kind of bargain, whether it's for Gaia at Valencia. We go back to Valencia because they always seem to have troubles. But yeah, it certainly is going to be Alba uh, for future notice. So Eric, I'm going to just take uh, Alba a little bit from you with the keep. Uh, but the next one is Alejandro Balde. What, what, and I've said on the show before what I think should happen with Balde. But Eric, what does Barcelona do with Balde next season? Uh, Balde is either a keep. Uh, or he's a loan and get minutes with the intention of bringing him back. Because I agree with you that that keeping Jordi Alba for this season, for this market, is the right play for Jordi. But filling that left back uh, uh, backup for, for Jordi really becomes a, a top priority for the club. And looking at Mark Kukurea going to City for a reported 30 million euros, 
Um, seeing the, the lack of backup that we have at left back and how we've mismanaged that position, it becomes an urgent need to fill that if Jordi Alba stays another year. If Jordi Alba doesn't stay for some bizarre reason, it becomes an even higher priority. And the club really needs to address um, the fullback positions, but specifically the left back. And, and Jordi, you know, had a great season this year. And I think he's certainly earned another year. Uh, if you're just taking it on a season by season basis, he certainly earned his role, you know, next season. Um, but but Jordi is a question of when. It's a question of when. And then, you know, Balde, uh, Balde is a good player with a lot of promise and he could be an answer at left back. But the reality of our club right now is that we haven't given a lot of time the ability to develop at left back from the way that we've managed Furpo, let, letting go of Kukurea, um the, the lack of depth at that left back position over the last several seasons, we have to fill that. And Balde cannot be overlooked. He has to be developed and given a chance to fill that left back role. Yeah, you can keep going on that list. Digne, Grimaldo. Uh, yeah, we're, we're not done there. It's a disappointingly long list. It is. Yeah, and many of them, good for them, have turned out well. So it's a mark that La Masia can produce outside backs at a high level, but it's just a matter of keeping them at the camp. No. Uh, next up is potentially one of the backups for Jordi Alba next season. But Eric, this one I should probably sit out. I think people are tired of hearing me talk about Jardino Dest and whether I would keep or sell him. And I think this is even a bit more nuanced than just keep or sell. I don't think, I guess this is up to us. So let's do it, Eric. Is it keep or sell for Jardino Dest? Keep and no additional comments provided. It, is, it doesn't okay. need to be said. You have to keep him. I got I to gotta warn you, Eric, you're going to be called a homer. You're going to be called sure. um, an American, maybe with an expletive at the end, but it's usually American, some kind of scum or some kind of synonym related to it that we are too biased. But what I actually said about the left back thing is why I would definitely keep him. It's not even that, that Danny Alves is, going to, is, is already 39 and is turning 40 in next spring. Now, Danny Alves is the next one. And again, this one, not up to us. It sounds like he is willing to end his deal in December. He's willing to just... For the second time, <laughs> the first time he was kind of kicked out the door. The second time around, it sounds like he is going to get that standing ovation that he very much deserves, arguably being the greatest right back of all time as fullbacks continue to get more and more important between the late 90s in this, in this new millennium when fullbacks have become an essential position on the field. Positional play has exploded in the last 20 years, and Danny Alves has arguably been the best of the bunch of all that time. So he will get his proper send off probably in December as he goes with Brazil to Qatar. So whether or not we want to keep or sell him, he's not even going to be sold. It's that he is going to ride off into that retirement sunset right before he turns 40 in the wintertime. And that means that you can say Azpilicueta, after missing out on, on Masraoui, like, I, again, I don't want to trade Azpilicueta at 33 for Sergino Des. It doesn't make any sense. Azpilicueta also can only play on the right side. He can also play center back, sure, but if... PK is still sticking around and Christensen is brought in. You've got four, again, plus Miko Marmol or whoever is, uh, even Chatty Roddy, who is, who is, uh, for Juvenil A, who has been uh, given a Barca B chance uh, for next season already, whether he renews, that's another thing. But I want to start to be able to bring up those Barca B center backs as the fifth option. We're talking about the Cobo de Rey. We're talking about um, whoever comes up or Cadiz as they struggle against relegation, I can promise you next season, or Mallorca, right? Because they're going to be right back in the fight next year, those two clubs. Uh, but those are the kind of players that need to come up as we're talking five. If you're talking Araujo, PK, Christensen, uh, and PK, and so uh, or whoever I missed there, you know the four. Uh, and so for as, as far as Aspaqueta goes, I just I, it seems redundant to bring in a 33 year old to play right back to take the place of Des. So I think it has to be a, a keep, especially because he can play left back. Yeah. And I think Xavi Xavi knows that as long as he can get Des to understand where he needs to be on the right side, plop him on the left. And the left side is also the strong side. So as long as he feels comfortable with Des' technical abilities to have them him on the side of the field with Ansu, who he's now trained with for three seasons, uh, with the likes, and uh, again, a full year of Pedri, who's going to make any left back look even better by being that left interior. Um, sure. I, I have Wage on the list. I think Wage, I'm not sure if his contract is up, but if he is around, I, I, can, I can't waste too much time with Wage. I am hope that he can continue his professional career. That's where he's out after that. Again, it was almost a career-ending injury that he suffered out on loan with, I believe it was, was it Nice in France or was that, I think it was in Greece when he got hurt. Maybe it was Nice that he was at first and then he went to Greece, got hurt in like game number two or three, slammed against the crossbar, uh, the, the post, and I just hope he can play professional football again. So I would give him a loan as long as his contract lasts and hope that he's able to earn his way to a professional contract next time out and he can continue on a career because he was a really, really promising 
right back. He was uh, for he was already called up to Senegal's first team. Uh, he was, I think he, I believe he may have gone to the African Cup of Nations, or at least he got an invite and was cut late. So Wage is just, it's a loan until you could get him back in, into gear. And then the next one, Eric, uh, a lot harder than Musa Wage. <laughs> it's, it's Sergio Busquets. Yeah, Sergio Busquets. Okay, before Sergio Busquets, I just want to say on the Dest Alves thing, I love Danny Alves. He's one of my favorite Barcelona players of all time. I'm so happy that he gets a send off, but he needs to go and he needs to make room for Dest. And there's an urgency at right back the same way that there is at left back. And and it's just it's a matter of putting our future before our present term and making sure that we're taking care of where this club needs to go. On Sergio Busquets, it's tough to think of somebody who's going to fill that position and fill it at the caliber that Busi has had for so long. But Busi's had a really trying couple of last seasons. And my same answer that I'm giving to PK is that Busi needs to go. We have to unload the age on our squad and we have to fill responsibly from La Masia and we have to fill responsibly from a wage perspective as well. And Busquets maybe has another year left in him if we keep him, but Busquets has to be a priority to fill and replace. And he, like I said with PK, has to have a minimum of one or a maximum of one season left uh, in terms of how long the club is willing to keep him on board at filling his Role is no easy feat. I don't know if it takes one or two players to fill that role in the long term and how trying that transition would be, but Busi's replacement has to be a priority for this club in the next season, maybe two. I just don't know how much longer Busquets has and which version of Busi we're going to get because Busi season over season hasn't been very consistent and throughout the season he struggled with consistency as well. Um, and so he has to be a priority. He has to be a priority the same way that, that the fullbacks are. Well, Eric, that was my biggest takeaway from Villarreal. Busquets played 90 minutes. Even when guys were getting their swan songs, their send-offs, their goodbye, thanks for coming to the club, no one came on for Busquets because there wasn't even a backup who wasn't good enough, right? It wasn't even like a... And funny that I'm mentioning Alex Song. He, the only reason I'm dragging Alex Song here into this, again, it was an unfortunate friendly fire on Alex Song, low, is because he did blow, admit... Low blow. No, no, no. He admitted that he came to Barcelona because of that sweet, sweet paycheck. And if he's going to do that, mm. then he came as a backup from Arsenal. He was a backup. But again, this isn't even Alex Song's situation where we can say, hey, that guy wasn't good enough. Or a Sergi Samper, who spent a lot of time in the academy, was injured, and he gets his final send-off. No, there was no final send-off for Busquets's, uh, you know, understudy or the guy that failed to take over his spot because there never was one. And so him playing 90 minutes yeah. against Villarreal is kind of, for me, the one takeaway I take really into next season saying, hey, you know, if he's still playing 90 minutes in that one, I mean, Kessier, it's a lot. It's a lot going to go on where Kessier fits and what that midfield is going to do. So I'm looking at the rest of our list and based on time as well, we're going to speed it up a bit. But I think the midfields and forwards are easier because at forward especially, you either produce or you don't. If you don't, we want to sell you. If you do, we want to keep you, of course. And then for the midfield, it's a lot of young players you want to keep. So, uh, Eric, I can't possibly spend more than two seconds on Pedri. Uh, and he's only got one name, so it makes it even easier. Pedri, keep. Pedri, keep. Easy. <laughs> Easiest Great. question of the day. Great. Uh, it's a, this one's not too much harder, especially when he renews. Gabi, keep. Keep. Yeah, it's a, yeah, we're doing, doing a little round here. Um, and then, okay, here it gets more confident. Well, actually, Pooj, I'm going to make this one even easier too. Pooj, sell. Yeah, unfortunately. Pooj, sell. Yeah, that's where we're at. Okay, and then the next two, now it gets really, really tough. Because Frankie de Young, I, I, I'm not going to take words out of your mouth again. The answer is keep. But there is a situation where he is sold. And that is the one guy that we talked about last week. With Barcelona's financial back against the wall, if you've got to sell one of those guys that's untouchable, one of those guys you don't want to sell, uh, I mean, I think you already mentioned it, Eric, that on your list, you're selling Ter Stegen before you're selling De Young. But it's, uh, it, that's what it sounds like to me. But for De Young, yeah, it's keep as long as you possibly can. And if there's a moment that's coming where you have to sell him, as I've said many, many times before, the club is in worse shape than you think they are because if they have to sell him to balance their books, then they are still in a lot of danger. Yeah, I think if we can afford to keep Frankie, then we need to keep Frankie. Frankie's an incredible player, and he should be on our like he should be part of the future project of our squad for the next several seasons if we can afford it. However, 
our club is in very, very rough uh, times financially right now. And if it just makes economic sense to get rid of him, it's really unfortunate to say this in the same breath, but I admire Frankie. I think he's somebody who could be the part of the future of our club. But if there's a time and the market makes sense and the club's back is, is against the wall, he's a player that you have to let go of. And it hurts to say, but I think that's just the practical truth. Uh, what about Nico? Because I, on my list, have Nico at loan because I think for his development at 20, Busquets is going to be here next year. And if Barcelona can keep Frankie De Young, of course, if De Young is sold, there's uh, obviously 100% Nico Gonzalez with the first team next year. But I would actually loan Nico because I think he is one loan away. He is, I think, 35 first team starts or 35 first team appearances, and by appearances, I mean, you know, regular minutes, even more so than he got under Xavi, away from being a starter at Barcelona and maybe being that third starter with Gabi and Pedri. And we might only be, as I said, two seasons away from that's where we're at. And not only that, not that you sell De Young, but if Xavi's going to play that 3-4-2 with the two holding midfielders and the two high interiors, then you're done. Then it's Pedri, it's Gabi, it's Nico, it's Frankie De Young, and you don't have to overthink that in two seasons' time. Yeah, definitely. I think Nico, if Nico goes at all, it's on loan. Otherwise, keep Nico. He's part of our future. Just depends on which pieces need to fall which way in the transfer market. He's either here on the first team or he's out on loan to make space and, and continue his development. Uh, next up is Roberto. Uh, I'm going to take words out of your mouth. We would both sell him. Everyone, everyone would sell him. But he is being kept to make, as I've said many, many times before, it seems like all the reports say the numbers are not adding up for Gabby's renewal until you get Sergio Roberto's salary lowered before January 30th to get Gabby's renewal done by January uh, by June 30th, rather. So that's what it sounds like. It sounds like he's being kept for financial reasons only. It's the same way why with Artur and Pjanic, I had nothing to say because I was not about football in any way, and this isn't about football either. So let's move on from there. Um, Ansu, we're back to the two words. Ansu, it's keep. Keep all day. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, again, I... Uh, Good luck, PSG. It's a billion. <laughs> if you you want to call, yeah, it's please. a billion. So there you go. Um, <laughs> he, then, he might be two. He might be two billion. Yeah. Uh, He's pretty special. And then Ferran Torres is also keep because not only was he, it's not even about his price tag. I always, I feel like I'm now, it's a knee-jerk reaction to bring up his price tag. It's not about the price tag. It's that he's 21 years old. Xavi clearly trusts him for a reason. And even if he's not one of the starting trident in Xavi's best Champions League, where we always do this, where we always default to a Champions League final starting 11, whatever. But if Ferran Torres is your fourth wing, uh, fourth midfielder, not winger, but if he's your fourth uh, uh, forward, there we go, I finally got a position. If he's your fourth forward, because he can play all three positions, you're in good shape. Your squad is pretty, it's in a good spot in the forward line if he's your fourth forward. But if he's your number one, as a lot of people have expected him now to be with Ansu returning and Demelay probably gone, then yeah, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, I think, I think Torres is a keep. I think there's maybe a couple situations that could play out on the transfer market where it might make sense to offload him, but otherwise I think I think he's a keep. Xavi clearly sees something in him. You know, maybe didn't get as much out of him as we wanted production-wise to make it a clear keep, but it's a keep. All right, I'm actually going to put the next group all together because I think they really do work in dominoes, in tandem, where I think the club is going to pick some and have to get rid of others. For Adama Traore and Luke de Jong, it's really easy. Their loans are over and they're gone. And you say thank you, especially thank you to Luke de Jong. Uh, I hope that there's one or two more times that we're going to speak of him. And who knows, like if he scores, a, a, finally gets that bicycle kick against the A-League All-Stars down in Australia, then maybe we'll talk about him uh, next week. But Luke de Jong, loan over, Adama, Lu, uh, loan over. So Adama, unfortunately, couldn't make it work in his return. Uh, and then next after that, it's... Aubameyang, Brothwaite, Dembélé, and, and, and Ezabde. And of that bunch, the only easy one there is Brothwaite, who is clearly sold. Xavi's already told him he's not in his plans. He's going to be sold. But then Aubameyang, Memphis, Dembélé, and Abde. There we go. I finally got all of them. So yeah, between Aubameyang, Memphis, Dembélé, and, and Abde, I could see a situation where, for me, of that list, I would keep Dembélé and Aubameyang, but... And I would loan Abde. Let's put that. I wouldn't sell Abde, but I would loan Abde. And there is an argument, though, that if you told me that if he goes for $15 million, that is a totally fair number for as Abde, and you've got to cash in now. Because there's a circumstance two years from now where he's playing in the second division in Spain. Because those speedy wingers who are 19, 20 years old, that's going to happen. If he doesn't produce or has no end quality for two years, then he'll be 22, 23, and he's going to be looking for a place to play in Portugal or in Russia or, you know what I mean, or somewhere else uh, in the world. So... 
that's why I would keep Aubameyang. I would keep Dembélé if possible. And I would actually sell Memphis. I think he is the odd man out there if Dembélé renews. But if Dembélé doesn't renew, then I think you're stuck with Memphis next season. And he's got to stay around. So I feel like, again, Eric, I don't want to take it away from you. It's up to you. But I, I think that's how it all shakes out for me. And then for if, he, if Dembélé is gone, and with Rafinha not, not coming, likely because Leeds United stayed up, and, you know, in the final day, it was very dramatic. All Barca fans watching the relegation fight, which, yes, <laughs> a little embarrassing, sad to say. Um, but with Rafinha likely probably not on the way now because he's going to be outside of Barca's price range and the market for wingers being really, really tough with what Barca actually has to do. I mean, that's a lot to ask as Abde next season. It's a lot. And very much like Nico, I want to see him at, on a loan for one season. And sure, he can come back and it'll make a lot of sense if he does develop in one year. I agree with with what you said, I would just add that I think with Azabde, um, if he were to come up for purchase for something like 15 million, I would want Barcelona to put a clause in his contract that we get the preferred right to purchase him when his contract becomes available for purchase, or uh, I guess, you know, depending on what league it goes to, uh, but that we would get first right to purchase him because if we're going to let a, a talent that young go, we still have to maintain the rights to get them back. So uh, I agree that he should go out on loan, uh, and if he gets sold, he needs to be able to come back. Um, I think odd man out is probably Memphis. I think that was kind of the way that the season shook out for him. Uh, I think it's unfortunate because he really fought hard and, and, and did a great job for us as a striker um, and filled in a gap when we needed him. But um, yeah, I think of those names, he's probably the most sensible one to be out. But as Abde needs to be kept on a on a leash and be able to come back to the club if he's sold and and otherwise just loan. Yeah, it's weird to say with Memphis because he was tied for the uh, the team leading goals with 13. And Obama Yang shows up in January <laughs> and has that mark and Memphis was hurt for so much of the second half of the season. Well, at least through the winter time as Obama Yang and Ferran Torres and all of them got their their feet, but yeah, so just to wrap up that first team discussion, on to Australia to take on the A-League All-Stars on Wednesday. Marmol, Sanz, Balde, Tanas, Hondro, and Aranda. And we waited for Hondro. He never came the last two games. Waited for him to get an appearance. Defensive midfield, <laughs> Busquets' replacement. I guess it's not him. Or I guess Xabi just wanted to bring him up and make him feel like he was a part of it. But I guess he'll probably may not only make his first team debut, but he might make his only appearance in a first team shirt. Uh, in Australia, in a friendly that doesn't really matter, in a postseason friendly, which is a, a weird thing. So, all right, as we go down the stretch, we've got about seven, eight minutes left, Eric. So not to knock it into hyperdrive, but for the Femini, I'm not ready to really do that yet. I think as much as I take, I, I don't really take losses hard. I move on very quickly. Everybody knows once I'm done writing the match review, I've pretty much emotionally settled in on where I'm at. I didn't do a match review for the Barca Femini, losing 3-1 to Lyon in the Champions League final. And, you know, personnel-wise, it was tough to watch because it was three mistakes from players that have been, when I say perfect, I truly mean practically perfect, especially in the league. They've been perfect all year round. Irene Paredes had her very worst game of the season in the Champions League final. Sandra Panos in goal has the, her worst game maybe ever in a Barcelona uniform. And it all just culminates in just a heart, heartbreaking loss to Lyon, who were fantastic. They were phenomenal. They were the dynasty. They were the team who deserved to win their eighth straight, uh, not straight, but their eighth Champions League. And Barcelona are, uh, unfortunately, it felt like they were there all season long. And last year, for two years now, they have been at that level. And against Wolfsburg in the last semifinal, they weren't there. They weren't where they needed to be. And then, then in the Champions League final, they were not anywhere where they needed to be. And that's what's so heartbreaking because for 22 months, they were. They were good enough. And then they weren't in the 90 minutes when they had to be. I, I will say that I think that the women had an incredible season. They had a perfect run at La Liga. That is more than I think any of us ever would have asked of them. And they exceeded that expectation. And it is incredible. If you back track just to Friday night. Friday night, we had gone perfect in La Liga for the women. They were at a Champions League final, and they're in the Copa de la Reina semifinals with a clear track heading them to the finals, uh, you know, knock on wood. Uh, so I think that the women have had an incredible season. The result that they had in the Champions League final does not take any of that away from the successes that they've had this season. They've been lights out, absolutely incredible. They've sold out the Camp Nou. They've set, what was it, back-to-back -back records on attendance for a women's team, I think. Yeah, 90,000. Uh, they did 90,000 twice 
Yeah. That is a full like, standing ovation. And they got standing back ovation then. Yeah, back to back, 90,000. What they've done, not to cut you off, but what they've done for women's football, even in a loss in the incredible. Champions League final, is incredible. Absolutely. They have taken women's football a farther. And it's, yeah, it's because Barcelona has more fans than Lyon. It's as simple as that. That Barcelona is sure. a bigger brand on the global scale than Lyon is. And those Barcelona fans showed up and they took women's football to yeah. new heights. Absolutely. Even in loss, there's so much to be proud of. Yeah. And I think, I think the women have done such an incredible job that every single weekend they've made a case to play at the Camp Nou. I don't think there's any case for them to have done this well and to be playing in the mini, if that's what we still call it, every weekend. There's no reason that Saturday can't be the women, the women's team and then Sunday can be the men's or vice versa. 100%. Or do a double header and make this all about football. It's not about the men anymore. It's about total football. It's yeah, total well, football, and the women are a part of that. Yeah, let me take, be a real take cynic, them though. off of the lockers and put okay. both of them on there, or just make them black and yeah, or, well, uh, red and blue. All in, yeah. all in on seeing the women every single week. Yeah, let, they've let, earned it. Let me be the let me be the cynic here. Uh, it's all about the revenue. Let's get. I mean, the the men averaged for the for the second half of the season when things were going well. They still averaged what fifty five thousand in the seats, and the women have. Yeah, not everyone's going to be ninety thousand, but if they average. 35,000 even, or if they average 20,000 on, you're right, on a Saturday, and, or the men are on the road for the weekend, and you put the, the women in the, in the, the Camp no on that weekend, that's 35,000 people when the Estadi uh, Johan Cruyff has room for 6,000. <laughs> so there's a yeah. lot of revenue. And you know that uh, Juan Laporta and that board, if there's anything they love to do, it is to find ways to go down to Australia and make 5 million euros and make revenue. <laughs> so you could do that on a weekend with the Femini, of course. Yeah. So, all right, we're going to pivot to two quick more hitters about the transfer market over the summertime, and then we got to get out of here. So first, Eric, I'm going to throw it to you. Kylian Mbappe, I got to do it. It's not going to be the cover or anything like that, even though everyone else was plastering it over uh, us and sport and everywhere else. But how does Mbappe staying at PSG affect Barcelona, do you think? Can we just take a minute and relish the fact that Real Madrid didn't get their signing that they had been hyping up all season? There's a there's yeah. a footballing part to this, but I just want to soak in their tears for just a moment. <laughs> oh, that was so good. Okay. What it means for us is it means that PSG is now probably the favorite to win the Champions League again, or they're in the top three teams named next season, and Barcelona is not one of them. And that hurts us pretty bad. However... It means that La Liga, the road to La Liga, for better or for worse, becomes a little bit easier for us, a little bit more manageable, depending on what uh, Real Madrid does to shore up uh, that position that they're clearly targeting in the offseason. Um, so potentially it makes La Liga a little more manageable for us. Less competition isn't really good for us, but on a practical, we need to win trophies and get experience level, maybe it's not so bad. It makes Champions League a really daunting task for us. Um but, you know, and, and then it really creates who I think is going to be the next topic of what happens with Lewandowski. Really, really tricky. Well, I think Barcelona Champions League wise, I would keep going with this conversation. Barcelona, if Ansu and Pedri and Gabi and Rajo, you know the names, if they're ready next season, then I don't care who PSG has. Then they're ready next season. But still, Barcelona's Champions League hopes, like being able to contend for that year in and year out, is still two to three years away when PSG is going to have to worry about this guy named Lino Messi being 35, 36 at that point, and having Neymar at that point, he's going to be 32, but his ankles and his injuries have made him, I mean, who knows how much, how long Neymar has left, and then you go up and down that squad. They fortified a Sergio Ramos this year, and that didn't really truly work out, so PSG is going to have to spend millions and millions, and you know, just like Barcelona, if PSG calls you, you go as high as you can. You say, I want $100 million for my players from PSG, and they need to price, I mean, other teams need to price gouge these super clubs in the same way that they did Barcelona and the same way they tried to do for Real Madrid and seemingly aren't very successful to it. But yeah, it's the Madrid part of it that, again, I'll try to be positive with you, that I think Madrid are going to go out and they're probably going to grab Rafinha, to be honest with you, from Leeds. I think they're just going to pay that release clause now uh, because they need a winger. And then Chuamani was probably going to go there anyway. It's going to break all of our hearts, including Kevin Williams, and we're all going to be really sad, but I, th I think he's going to go there anyway, if not Liverpool. And then or they go for Jude Bellingham already, maybe a year or two early from Dortmund because they have now money. They're flush with cash. If they were going to pay the wages of Kylian Mbappe, they're going to fill in the gaps and they've been waiting for this opportunity. And now their plan B, I mean, listen, here's again, the, the bright side is that Barca, they don't have any money to spend. So if Barca finds some discount deals like they did with Aubameyang, like they did, I mean, you could say arguably with Danny Alves, 
Uh, if they can go out and Shuamani and Christensen and those free transfers, you know, those are free transfers. If they're anywhere near what Real Madrid might be spending 65 million euros on, right? What if Kessier is just as good for the next two seasons as Chuamani is in a Los Blancos uniform? That There is a world, an easy world, where that happens. Kessier just won the Serie A title with AC Milan. He's a good player, right? He's just fine. And he plays a very similar play, uh, style as Chuamani, except Chuamani is much better defensively as a six, what, which is what Barcelona's need is. But looking beyond their need and just looking at the player, Kessier just won the Italian uh, the Italian title. Like he's, he's a good player. And there's a world where Real Madrid wastes and spends a lot of money because now, just like Barcelona, with that Neymar cash, uh-oh, we, we've got a, a, a just a pile of money burning a hole in our pockets. We got to figure something out. Uh, and that's where we go from that. And where Barcelona might spend some of their money, by the way, speaking of, the only two rumors we have left, Lewandowski, by the time this show comes out, there's going to be a billion other rumors about Lewandowski, of course. Uh, but as I said, Lewandowski is going to be just would be a terrific stopgap to make Barcelona be able to contend for the Liga title for the next two years right away. And then in two years time, when again, Ansu and Pedri and that whole group is ready, then you're in good shape. So Lewandowski to me is a no lose situation. And he again, I think with a, a three year contract, even he's going to give you the production for that contract. I'm not worried about that at all. And then the other ones, Ruben Nevish and Martin Zubmendi. It goes back to the Mescu and podcast thing. I'm reading a book right now, Simon Cooper's book about uh, Barcelona, and he, we, they talk in and about Mescu and un, 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 un Club, rather. Uh, Mescu and podcast, of course, because I always have Rafa on here. So Mescu and <laughs> Un Club, but, uh, and then La Masia. La Masia is supposed to fill in the gaps from the academy when you can fill in roles when those players are quote-unquote good enough, and then you bring in top, top stars. That's what you do. Just the cherry on tops, just the guys that are going to win you a Champions League trophy. Those are the guys you bring in. Lewandowski is that star. And my only question is about Zubamendi and Nevesh. I don't know if those are those top, top players. So I don't know if you have to continue to kick the can down that road. But I will say about Nevesh, he is 25, has played in the Premier League, and at a position that is not flashy, maybe he is exactly what Barcelona need. And if he's at the right price, it might make sense. And then for Zubamendi... He is just 23. He turned 23 in February and has only played one season of top flight football for Real Sociedad as a starter after being a rotation piece last year. So at, at 23, he is still, I will say, even learning the position. We don't know what his ceiling is. And if Xavi trusts him, you know, Eric, I'm going to do this all summer long. If Xavi says yes and signs off on that player, very much like Kessier, I had the Milan guys came on. They tried to explain it to me. I'm still trying to make Kessier work in my brain. If a player doesn't seem to work to me, but Xavi says it's going to work, just trust me, I'm going to trust Xavi at least for another year. Yeah, I think with Lewandowski, it's it's a matter of philosophy, right? It's probably, we only need one signing. If you if you were to ask me how the club should go into every offseason, it's that you're maybe targeting one to two people total for the whole squad, and the rest needs to be homegrown or long-term projects because they fit the Cruyffian philosophy. FDJ, I think, is one of those. Frankie. Uh, because Frankie really comes from that Cruyffian school. He doesn't come from the academy, but he fits perfectly inside of what our club makeup should be. And right now we have a lot of expiring uh, players in age, and we should be focusing on youth and rebuilding from within. And if you have to go to the market, make sure it's a long-term project. So if we were to miss out on Lewandowski for the other two, or one of the other two, I wouldn't be too disappointed to be able to bring in youth in the place of, what is Louis, like 34? or something like that. Like he's he's getting up there and yes, we don't need more. Physically age. he's like 23. I mean, it's, he's oh, just he's a cyborg. I mean, he's an incredible player. He's yeah. incredible. But I mean, the, the my point being that how many years of that does he really have left? And True. we've had this problem for several seasons. We don't need to continue this issue if we can instead invest in youth and focus on uh recruiting better on on candidates coming into La Masia, on the candidates that come out of La Masia that have a chance to truly break into the first team to give more rotational minutes to our backup players to be able to put them into a backup role and develop them like we're going to need to do at left back and right back and at Boosie's position. We have to make space for these players and make time for them. And going to the market to fill these is making a problem. So if we lose out on these guys, I'm not going to be that you know too hurt about it. But if you're going to sign someone, sign somebody who comes in and makes that splash right now, is on the short term, and you're focusing on the rest of the squad on the long term. So Lewandowski, if he comes in, great. Give us one to two seasons. Get us farther into the Champions League than we're able to do in our current squad, but make that big splash. And the other two, if they're going to come in, they're probably not going to give us that splash. So make sure they're part of the long-term project. But if they're anything else, I don't want them. If they're just here for a couple seasons to spend some money, go. 
just end the conversation. Stick with who we have. Let's stay where we are for a couple seasons while we fix the squad. I would much rather have that than to be like frivolously spending money just because it's what we've been doing for the last decade. We don't need to be in that role anymore. We need to take care of our future. And so, you know, Louie, if you come, great. If you don't, I can live without it. And the other two guys, if they're long-term projects and they're young, great. Otherwise, see you later. We need to focus on other things right now. Yeah, well, let's do just that and end the conversation. I think it's a good place to stop it. As I've said many, many times, Pablo Torre from Racing Santander, the guy that Xavi called, the teenager that Xavi said, hey, I believe in you. That's why you should come to Barcelona and will likely be with Barca B, but I, I don't think so. I think he's going to be a first-team player. Regardless of who else even, I mean, I can have my mind changed by getting like a, a chew of money, but Pablo Torre is the guy I think next year that I'm just most excited about because he represents something. He represents a young player, Hope. He was the best player for his team in the third division in Racing Santander this season, and he helped them get promotion cries and uh, coming off the field like just what it meant to him uh, as a professional to have started his career there in the academy and both the fans and Pablo Torre know that this is just the beginning for that player and I'm really excited to see him next year and again that's the guy that's the kind of transfer that you do with all those variables as he gets older where the initial contract very much just like Pedri's the transfer fee is small but of course if the guys win Ballon d'Ors and do all these things Champions League he's going to be more expensive but by that time he's going to be worth it and those are the kind of deals that Barcelona has to investment, uh, invest in. And Pedri was one of the first, not even first, but he was one of the ones they did that with, Araujo the same way, and then going on to that with Pablo Torre is awesome. Well, speaking again, end of the conversation, this is going to wrap up another edition of the show. Thank you so, so much, Eric. Again, they can, that being everybody listening, can follow you down on social media, and that's in the show notes below. But more importantly for you, your connection to Los Angeles, the, the penny out there, and this is kind of a PSA for everybody. The season is over and the Penians have all departed. They're all going home uh, and, you know, or they're going to, as the U.S. Uh, in, at the end of July, maybe some of those Penians in the U.S. are descending upon uh, those locations in Miami and uh, at Red Bull Arena where the first team is going to be playing. I will be there at Red Bull Arena there in the end of July. So say hello. We'll have shows before that uh, regardless. But yeah. Find your local Pena now. Get in contact with them. Start to bother them now. And then join up for the new season in the fall. It, it, again, Pena's especially, I can speak for the ones I've been to in the U.S., but and beyond, they're great places to just enjoy your time as a Barcelona fan and a cool late with everybody else. Also, give some love to Blue Wire because they allowed me to go up to the very final minute here. Uh, Blue Wire Studio, it's a beautiful place here in Las Vegas. So if you ever do stay in the wind or in Las Vegas, just stop by. And it's not going to be me, likely, <laughs> all the way in Long Island, but wave. The professionals out here are terrific, the guys in the booth, as well as all the pros and all the celebrities that they have through here that, again, much, much more important to me. So thank them. I'm thanking them so much for allowing me to be here and, and in the film. This has been completely awesome. So also follow us on social media as well, Twitter and Instagram, at the Barcelona Pod, at Hilton D13 for me, Close Facer Group, YouTube. If you've been with us all season long, Patreon, you know all the places to find us. And we have our merch store as well. That's the Barcelona Podcast on Teespring. So that wraps up another edition, a special edition of the Barcelona Podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon and Forza Barca.